Hello, I'm Alan Wing, and this is a talk on reach to grasp coordination of hand and arm, which is part of the workshop on grasping as a sub action of manipulation. I'm an experimental psychologist. I'm researching perception and action at the University of Birmingham. And for me, reach and grasp is a model of sensory motor coordination. So the question is how we coordinate the arm for reaching, taking the hand to a location in space, and how we coordinate the hand shape and size in grasping the object. Today, I've got two clinical movement specialists with me. I've got Professor Paulette Van Fleet from the University of Newcastle in Australia. Hi there, yes, I'm a researcher and a physiotherapist and I've looked at the differences between people with stroke reaching to grasp something and healthy people in order to find out what we have to do in therapy to fix that. And I have a special interest in reach to grasp coordination. Thank you, Paul. And Ailey Turton from the University of the West of England, who is an occupational therapist. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm... Um... I'm also a researcher. I'm interested in recovery and rehabilitation from stroke. I work with local um, occupational therapists and physiotherapists in stroke research, but also I work in the Bristol Robotics Laboratory where we're developing devices for rehabilitation. Thank you. Ed. So we all met in Cambridge in the 80s and here are the backs in Cambridge and Paulette and I were working in the Medical Research Council Applied Psychology Unit just to the south of King's College, Chapel in the Backs. And Ailey was working in Addenbrooke's Hospital, which was a, a further little bit south, just a short bicycle ride away from the Applied Psychology Unit uh, in the Occupational Therapy Department. We were all interested in patient-oriented research. And for me, at the Applied Psychology Unit, my remit was really to think about the translation of theory of about the control of movement, which had been drawn from research in uh, healthy adults, and how it would it relate to patients with movement disorders? Paulette. So Alan and I looked, uh, we did a little study looking at people reaching to uh, the handle of a mug or the whole mug. The mug was in the same place, and we were looking at the effect on the kinematics of the reach to these two different environmental contexts. And we did find differences in the reach, and that made me realise in therapy how important contextual information was in our training. And Ailey? Yeah, when we met, um, I was working on a project to try and measure people's recovery from, hand, uh, from stroke, measure their hand function. Um, as therapists, we were really uh, keen to know that uh, our patients were recovering and what to do about it. So having got measures to... Uh, measure recovery, we also need to know uh, from the science of how to um, help them to recover their hand function. Thank you. So we're going to talk about reach to grass findings, but first of all, I think a good starting place is a reaching project. This was looking at hemiparetic stroke participants making aiming movements. And now because they were hemiparetic, they would have a weak arm and leg on one side, opposite to the leading in the brain, which would cause the weakness in the first place. And so to help them make movements that we could actually study, we would provide support for the arms, which were uh, enabled movement against gravity by this support, which uh, hooked onto the arm, to, to the wheelchair at the back. So with the arms supported, what we did was to position uh, a, a target on a, a flat screen above their arm, and ask them to make a movement from under the chin out towards this visual target. And our interest was in the shoulder and co elbow coordination. And so we would have sample results here, which look like this, which shows a trajectory for the hand moving from under the chin out towards the visual target, which at first, only two weeks after the stroke, showed a, a very poor coordination of shoulder and elbow. So this would be shoulder movement taking the hand away from the straight line path and elbow perhaps with a little bit of shoulder bringing you forward again and this would be a, a kind of broken down uh, movement which was very slow and erratic in its progress whereas at six weeks post stroke the movement towards the target was much straighter and much faster so there's better shoulder and elbow coordination. Ailey I think you've got a comment on this. Oh yeah yeah um, 
Yes, so this project took place in my workplace in the Occupational Therapy Department at Addenbrooke's and it was very helpful to see how important it was to have a target for recovery. If uh, um, it's only because of the target being there that um, people had the incentive to improve their coordination and get more accurate. Um, often at that time therapy took place without an object and um, really in practicing just elbow movements or shoulder movements there's no um, there's no cost to doing those movements inaccurately so I think um, now nowadays we use targets all the time to help the recovery of our movements. So, so this movement then was taking the hand out to a position in space often is called reaching to a point or aiming and what we uh, look at here is the coordination of the elbow and shoulder to one outcome which is hand position in space. Now we're going to turn to reaching and grasping where we're now concerned with coordination of two separate components, separable components, physically separate, the, the hand shaping uh, and the arm positioning of the hand. So in looking at reach to grasp, our starting point was the work of Mark Janero, who came to Cambridge in 1980 to present at the Attention and Performance meeting that was being run there by the director of the Applied Psychology Unit, Alan Badley. So Mark Janero, he, he was a neurologist and very interested in the visual system. And in fact, that there are, if you like, two visual systems, a dorsal and a, a ventral route, taking visual information up to the brain. And he, everybody was at that time interested in the visual system, thinking about what was the separate functionality of those two streams of visual information taking uh, uh, environmental information up to the brain. And Janero's position was that, well, this might have separate roles for the transport and the grasp components of reaching, which are beautifully illustrated in this picture that he did with uh, multiple uh, flash photography. So as the hand is reaching to pick up this this ball, you can see that it starts close and gradually opens, opens a bit wider than necessary, and then starts to close just as it approaches in on a target. And this is summarized by this trajectory for the, the wrist displacement, which is smooth and coordinated with a slowing down towards the end, just as the target is contacted. And we see a, an opening and closing of the hand, which is smaller for a fine rod and wider for a big cylinder. But what's interesting is there's a maximum an aperture when the heart hand starts to close, which is pretty much in the same position, it's where the movement begins to decelerate just as it homes in on the target. And what Mark Janero's contribution was to say, well, let's say what the two visual systems, one responsible for object location and one for intrinsic objects of the, the, the object, and the visual information would feed through to provide uh, movement of the uh, arm to take the hand into the right position. So this was a channel, if you like, for transport of the hand towards the object. And this he contrasted with information which was coming from within the object about the size and its shape, which would adjust the finger size and its rotation to achieve a grasp. And this grasp would be triggered by this slowing down, this deceleration movement as the wrist came in close towards the target. So this was uh, an important uh, insight and set us all thinking. I think Paulette, you were going to make some comment on this. Yes, we can look at this in the clinical setting as well. You'll notice from the graph that the hand opening and the transport do start at the same time. And we can look at that with stroke patients. So if we present them with a target and we put a marker just after the start position of their hand, and then we watch from above whether the hand is open when it passes that marker. And that would indicate that the hand opening had been triggered by the reach. Alternatively, they may wait until they get very close to the object before opening their hand, which be, would, be, would be abnormal, but we do see that in stroke patients. And then we can target that to try and make them happen at the same time. Thank you. So now we're going to talk about an experiment that uh, was developed by myself with Ailey and with Carol Fraser, who was the head of the occupational therapy department at that time. And what we were interested in was whether it's really the case that grasp is only triggered by transport, as suggested by Janero, or whether in fact grasp takes more information from how the transport is proceeding and perhaps adjusts according to the transport phase, uh, perhaps in an anticipation manner. So for example, if you're reaching for something in the dark, it's likely you'll open your hand wider to compensate for the fact that you're not quite sure what you're reaching for where it is. 
So what we did was to arrange that participants would uh, reach out, pick up this dial balanced on them and pass it to the experimenter under three different conditions. In one condition, they would uh, reach with uh, normal vision at a normal speed. And these show the trajectories for the thumb position with the dotted line up to contact for one participant and another participant. They show the, uh, the thumb Y position, which is on an axis at right angles to the approach line. So this is an axis across the approach line. And we see the thumb is, is relatively stable on that approach line for both of these participants. Whereas the index finger shows a big opening and closing, which defines a point of maximum aperture, which coincides with, as Jeanne pointed out, the onset of the deceleration as you approach to contact the object. So this was a, a normal reach under normal conditions. What we did then was to ask participants to reach as fast as possible. They would still have vision uh, with which to see throughout the movement, but there'd be very little time because the movement's now much shorter to make an adjustment. There's no real deceleration phase or very small deceleration phase before they grasp the object. And so there's not much time to make a, a, a position corrections if you're slightly inaccurate as you're reaching. And this is even more uh, the case when you are reaching blind, you can't see where you're going. You look at where you're going, close your eyes and then start to reach. Now there's a long hesitant approach towards where they think the object is. And we can see everything is slow. And what is more, the aperture of the hand is wider. So to characterize this opening of the hand, which is wider, the uncertainty of the position of the hand when you're reaching, particularly when it's blind, but also when you're reaching fast, what we did was to say, what is the variability on the lateral axis uh, at right angles to the approach axis in normal reaching, in fast reaching and in blind reaching. And you can see in blind reaching, the variability at right angles to the approach line is much more variable than in normal reaching. And in fast reaching, which is a little bit more variable than in normal reaching. And as you get closer to the object, just before contact, the same relationship with greater variability for blind reaching than for normal reaching is also observed. Then what we did was to look at the aperture of the hand in these three different conditions to see whether the aperture of the hand was changing. And as you went from normal fast to blind, with blind being more variable than normal, what you can see is the aperture is much wider for the blind condition than it is for the normal condition, and the fast lies somewhere in between. So this really does characterize this idea that the hand's aperture is sensitive to the way the movement will take place. If there's an anticipation of the difficulty in locating the object, it's compensating for the transport in ways which had not been picked up by Jeanne before. At this point, I think I hand over to Ailey, who's going to make a relationship of this finding to what she's observed in hemiparetic stroke patients. Yeah, shortly after this experiment, <coughs> we use the same dial to uh, look at how people recover after a stroke. And they were uh, videoed every few weeks over a period of time. And up here on the slide, there's uh, two charts from one participant. Um, her movement was quite inaccurate to start with, and this was measured from the natural de deviation of the wrist on its way to um, the object. And uh, although it did, it did get better um, and uh, meet the accuracy of the unaffected hand showed in the dotted line below. And you see on the other chart, at the same time, she could open her hand and she opened her hand wider on the affected side, we think to compensate for the inaccuracy of her movements. And this did uh, decrease as time went on to get closer to the hand opening of the unaffected side. So uh, people who can open their hand uh, wide after stroke, then they can use the same compensatory mechanism for any inaccuracy of the transport component. Thank you. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about a case study of a, a good user of a prosthetic hand carrying out reach and grasp. And so this was a study conducted in collaboration with Carol Fraser, whom we've already mentioned. And the, the, the volunteer, the participant, was a young girl with congenital absence of the left arm below the elbow. She had a Otto Bock prosthesis, which provided spring closing to keep the hand closed. And the opening, which would open the hand with equal and opposite movements of the finger and thumb taken away from the closed point, being produced by tension on the op cord that ran over to the opposite shoulder. So a forward shrug of this shoulder would put the tension on and open the hand. So what we saw uh, in asking this participant to make the reaching 
towards the DAO and pick up the DAO and pass it to the experimenter was in the natural uh, uh, right hand, uh, a nice fluid approach to the target, whether the target was a, a narrower or a wider DAO, and the aperture of the hand in, the natural hand in reaching for the DAO was greater for the wide DAO than for the narrow DAO. And this uh, aperture started to close at this point where you can see the deceleration towards the, the target DAO. With the artificial left hand, what we see is that the movement takes considerably longer, 50% longer. There's still a, a trajectory which is more or less the same for the narrow and the wide DAO, both balanced on end, so there were difficult tasks for her to pick up. But what we can see is that there's more wide opening of the hand earlier on, and this wide opening, which is differentiated between the narrow and the wide dial, stays open up till almost the point of contact and then closes rapidly at the last minute. So she had to change uh, details of the coordination of opening and closing of the hand. But we also noticed something else that was particularly interesting in her reaching movements. And this was when we looked at the uh, movement of the thumb and the index finger relative to the axis as approach towards the target. So if we take the up point, most of the trajectory is fairly straight towards the target. There's just a bit of swinging around at the beginning of both of those. And what you can see is that with the natural right hand, she's largely reaching not so much with the thumb, which is relatively stable on that axis, but mostly with the finger. The, the aperture is being controlled by the, by the index finger opening and then closing. And that's true for the wide and the narrow dial. And the same sort of pattern can be really seen with the artificial left hand. So the thumb stays relatively constant in its approach relative to that uh, line of approach, where it's the index finger that seems to be doing mo most of the opening and closing. So the question then arises as well, how did this occur? Because what I had said to you before was that her thumb and her index finger extend in symmetric manner around the axis of closure. So there's a natural symmetry in the hand and what so uh, this participant was doing actually was achieving stability of the thumb by a little maneuver to give what we thought was a stable visual reference as she approached the target. And I haven't got the part of the slide which shows this on the slide, but basically what she did was to, uh, as she was closing the hand, uh, arrange for a rotation, which would in fact, rather than giving symmetric up equal and opposite movements of the thumb and the index finger, would produce a rotation which would keep the thumb in a constant position as most of the movement was coming out in the index finger. Ailey, did you have a comment on this slide? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that um, Carol Fraser was, um, who worked with you in, on this study, was um, responsible for training uh, um, from a regional center, training people to use artificial limbs. And uh, these results must have helped enormously in that training process with uh, both uh, adult and, and children using their new limbs. Also, I think it shows how important it is to use these kind of studies when um, working with engineers to design new prosthetics. Because uh, if they'd have known that you needed a stable uh, thumb, maybe it would have been designed a little bit different in those days. So an, an interesting question <laughs> or challenge for the engineers here, I think. So, uh, I want to bring in one further case study, and this involved a patient with cerebellar ataxia. So just to say that the, uh, the central nervous system has a number of different structures within the brain, which support both the feed forward motor commands that drive the hand towards the target, and also the feedback adjustment that goes on during movements. And the brain structures that are involved include not only the cortical structure, but the subcortical structure of the cerebellum, and the basal ganglia. So here's the cerebellum below the main cortex, the cerebellar cortex is there. Then we have the basal ganglia and they're linked through the thalamus and both of these centers then project up to the parietal cortex, the somatosensory area and the frontal cortex with the motor area. So there's a number of different regions in the brain all subserving different aspects perhaps of any movement task which might include reaching to grasp. So we were interested to see a patient uh, in her thirties who had had uh, a right-sided cerebellar tumor removed, which left her with an ataxia affecting particularly the, the right side. So here are samples of her writing with her, she was ambidextrous with her left hand, which is very nice and smooth, whereas her right hand was rather large and disjointed and, and awkward to control. And if we asked her to make a pointing movement towards a, a target 30 centimeters in front of her, 
with her left hand, she was much straighter. This is the lateral deviation as she moves towards that target than she was with her ataxic uh, right hand, which shows a lot of side to side deviation. And what we found in reach to grass was that for this patient, we see this is now plotting the hand aperture as a function of the uh, transport position. We see a, a smooth function for the opening and closing of the hand as one would expect with the left hand. But for the right hand, it is somewhat more variable in its opening and closing, but it's much wider and much wider from early on. So there are changes in this patient on one side of the brain caused by the cerebellar damage, which uh, uh, are not seen on the other side, which gives some clues as to the role of the cerebellum. And there was a follow-up study then that uh, a, a PhD student working with Paulette and myself worked on where she was contrasting the effects of cerebellar lesions, a group of cerebellar patients, were compared with a group of patients who had their lesions in the parietal cortex. I think Paulette is now going to tell us a bit more about that in her uh, comments about the translation of what we've been talking about to clinical rehabilitation. Yes, just a bit of background to that study with Trudy. I think we're all interested in the uh, reach to grasp implications for neurorehabilitation, and especially beyond the, um, the muscle weakness and the muscle uh, neuromuscular control, which is normally looked at in the clinic. And so um, we were asking questions like, um, what parts of the brain control reach to grasp normally? What happens when you have a, a lesion in a particular area? What does that do to reach to grasp? And also, that how do we base our treatment strategies based on that knowledge? And so we thought um, we'd write a discussion article, and in that we drew attention to the fact that it was important to combine brain impairment and kinematic measures uh, when looking at these things in patients um, and looking at these things in a functional context. And that's what we did with Trudy's study. Um, we did that comparison. She perturbed the reach. We looked at the effect on the hand opening in people with cerebellar lesions, people with parietal lesions, and also uh, healthy people. And indeed, we found a early hand opening uh, with the cerebellar group, which does follow on nicely from the single case study Alan just described. And it also helps us in therapy because we then knew we had to target that behavior in people with cerebellar lesions and, and see if we could remedy that to more like normal uh, performance. So I've whizzed through the whole thing there. You can just do all the new points there, Alan, thank you. And that's just summarizing the things I said. And then just to finish with in the future, we were recommending that we not look just at brain lesions, but what happens to the brain network when someone has a stroke. Um, because obviously we have a distributed network for various functions like movement. And then we can base our treatment choices on the viable brain networks that we believe to be left after the lesion. Thank you, Paula. So in, in summary, we've been talking about the reach and grasp task, and we've taken a few, uh, a couple of studies of unimpaired participants doing reach and grasp, and then we also talked through a couple of patient studies. And I suppose our main findings about hand-arm coordination are how aperture compensates for transport uncertainty, and how the individual digit, in, usually in this case the thumb, provides guidance to a grass point, which says something about visual feedback control, we would argue. We think there are implications of this work for uh, development of uh, robotic reach and grass, which uh, might be patterned more on uh, hu human movement control. But we also think there are important implications for rehabilitation, and we, we hope to return to that point in answering questions which will come up after the talk. So for now, it just remains for me to say thank you to everyone for listening. And particular thanks to Paulette and to Ailey for joining me in this conversation about Reach to Grass. Thank you. Thank you.